I've had the fabulous opportunity to meet a lot of fabulous people through this YouTube adventure. And some of them, as it turned out, were right in my own hometown and I hadn't, our paths hadn't crossed yet. And one of those was Matt Hallman. I met Matt through the channel. And it came to my attention that he is a most remarkable example of blending courage, creativity, organization, and high-tech um, woodworking tools that I've ever kind of run across, that particular blend. So I'm gonna take you into Matt's shop and I'm gonna give you a chance to get acquainted with a young man who had a seriously worthwhile and important career in the Air Force as a flight paramedic, came out into the private sector, continuing that really worthwhile and intense job as flight paramedic, and then fell in love with woodworking through his grandfather's example, and set his sail to become a successful woodworker in this part of Oregon and extend his sphere of influence just as far as he could. He's got cool tools. He's got old tools. He's got state-of-the-art tools. He's got good, he's surrounded himself with good people. He's built a thriving business in cabinets and, and beautiful furniture right here in a little part of the world where it's not easy to build a thriving business like that. And as you watch this, keep in mind that one of the big keys to him sort of breaking free from where he was and going where he wanted to go was the self-discipline to hang on to the good job that he had and push his dream forward from the back, keeping a hold of that cash generating, really worthwhile career of flight paramedic and preparing to step into the next worthwhile, captivating, and hopefully cash generating career as high-end woodworker. Come with me to Hallman Woodworks. Matt Hallman. Hey Scott, thanks for coming. Nice well, to meet you, welcome man. Welcome to Wood Shop. Thank you. This is a wood shop. Yeah, it is. Deluxe. Yeah, we're uh, yeah, we're doing pretty good out here. Yeah, it's awesome. So all of this is fascinating, but what's really interesting to me is how did you get to here? What was the goal? What was the motivation? Just kind of give me a thumbnail sketch of how you got from the Air Force to running a serious woodwork business. Yeah. So um, I kind of I'm the guy that grew up with the the grandfather that had a small shop. He built every single piece of furniture in our house um, by hand in his small, I mean, his shop was nothing but a postage stamp. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it's amazing what he was able to produce out of it. So I've always had the passion and the love for woodworking, kind of learning from him. Um, so you had a tight relationship with granddad. Yeah. Lucky boy. Yeah, he's, yeah, probably one of my idols. Lucky boy. He passed about four years ago, so maybe trying to keep on the legacy with yeah. the family and everything else. Yeah, so that's awesome. But yeah, um, got out of the Air Force, um, immediately got a job working as a firefighter paramedic. Um, that's what I did in the Air Force, you know, and I just felt like the Lord was calling us back to Roseburg to start a family. So mm -hmm. we moved back up here. Um, and uh, yeah, from that, from moving back up here, we had, I had a bunch of bad calls, as you know, Scott, um, uh, 2015 in October, we had a, the UCC school shooting. Um, and I struggled with it. We were there. Let me, let me step in here. So we had we had an active shooter tragedy right here in this little bitty safe corner of Southern Oregon. And so you were one of the guys that showed up there that had to deal with the chaos. Yeah, I, I kind of I came a little late to the show. Um, I was actually off duty that day. But when that happened, everybody came in mm -hmm. and supported UCC. Um, yeah, and we went out to the college and, you know, it was yeah. a big deal. So 2015 was a really rough year for me. Um, and, you, and you had some other bad calls, bad, yeah. as bad luck would yeah. have it as yeah. a paramedic. Yeah, 15 was 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 real bad. So basically, I, I needed a healthy outlet to process all that. Um, went and got some help at the VA, which was really, really helpful. Um, but yeah, still struggling. So needed a healthy outlet. And I just kind of found myself back to woodworking. Back to woodworking. So from there... And, and Grandpa was still there. Yes, he was. Yeah, yeah, he was. Absolutely. absolutely. He. I wish you could see the full spectrum of the shop now, but, um, you know... That's in the Lord's hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's awesome. So, but yeah, we started. I started making stuff. Yeah, I guess um, making stuff for friends, making stuff for family. You know, and then one thing led to another. Hey, Matt, can you do this? Hey, Matt, can you do that? Hey, Matt, you know. And so, just started piecing it together. And then um, we were living in town, um, in a suburb town. I was just working on my garage. At yeah. time, like many woodworkers Classic do. Classic story. Got room for a table saw. Yeah, and then we uh, we really wanted to get out in the country, so we had an opportunity to to buy this piece of property. Um, so we're on five acres out here, and man, I knew I wanted to have a shop. 
Yeah. I didn't know what capacity it was going to be. Had a lot of different ideas at the time, but I essentially uh, we built a wood shop. Wow. And uh, shortly right then, I was met uh, by Trenton Morrow, who was looking to do something different. Um, Trenton works with me all the time. He's my, he's completely different than me. He's the technology, CNC, IT design, like oh. anything on a computer. And so now we blended this together of like, I've got the experience and like the hard craftsmanship skills, uh -huh. but Trenton had the technology skills and the design skills is this different this different level yeah. that you don't often see, at least at the time, especially in woodworking. Yeah. So we just kind of blended those together. We started a company. Strength and weakness, weakness, strength, boom. Yeah. That's awesome. So I still work uh, as a flight paramedic in okay. town on the helicopter. Uh, I'm no longer on the ambulance. I'm just doing the flight thing. Um, my schedule there is really, really good. I work uh, two days a week. Um, so it ends up being actually like seven days a month. So because I work that kind of schedule, it allows me to be able to do all this. Wow. So, okay. so when we started, I didn't take a dime from the shop. We ba barely had enough money to support Trenton and Trenton basically lived on nothing. Yeah. At one time we, he barely had enough gas to even get to the shop, but you know what? Like we made it work and we just kept Holy on pressing and kept smart. on pressing and kept on pressing. So you started in your granddad's, then you worked out of your own garage. Right. And now you're here. Right. Okay. These aren't the same tools you started with. <laughs> no, they're not. What was that step like from a table saw and a jointer to this? What and what drove it? Job necessity. Uh huh. Yeah, you know we and I'm kind of notorious for basically, you know, like I said, because I was working full time, I didn't take a salary mm -hmm. for four years, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that, right? So we would bid actually on jobs that I didn't even have the tooling to do. Mm -hmm. Bid on the job take a deposit, buy the tool, do the job, mm -hmm. keep the tool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it naturally just kind of grew with that. Tools are expensive, as you know, Scott. Yeah, they are. You know, so it, it had to be this like almost, dare I say, organic process mm -hmm. of growing slowly and finding our needs and then being able to choose jobs according to the tooling. But you went from furniture to cabinets. I did. That's a radically different tool set. It is, absolutely. Some of them cross over, but man, you're absolutely right. Oh gosh, well show us, a t show us the flow and give us a thumbnail sketch of what these things do. Sure. So we get our raw product basically through this door and on this end of the shop, and then it kind of gets processed forward here. So basically, especially specifically for furniture, we put our hard milling tools on this side of the shop, which is why we actually have both planers here. First of all, this is our Cantec over under planer. It's 25 inches, does all of our S2S milling on our specifically on our raw lumber. And then I have, this is my big Powermatic planer from 1953. We put a big helical head in it, in it. And uh, it's almost, we almost use it as like a finishing planer. And then right next to that, I've got my uh, Shaper power feeder uh, with the slider that we use for different moldings and stuff that we're, we're making. Um, we also use it for, do for door construction for cabinets. And then we have a, a 36 inch or 37 inch, sorry, wide belt sander that's over here for all the sanding we're doing. And then as we move forward into the shop, we also have a big Cantex slider. Um, we don't really, we, we break a little bit of sheet good down on it, but not a lot. We, uh, we use the slider mostly for furniture stuff. And I've got a small grizzly eight inch planer or a joiner, sorry, over here. And then obviously bandsaw, drill press. And then now as we move a little farther down in the shop, this is where it gets more into the cabinet side, I would say. So we got our, uh, Shop Saver CNC, it's a five by 10. Um, we just upgraded that tool maybe about three months ago. And then we have our workbenches for, for production. And like I said, this side of the shop is uh, leaning more on the cabinetry side. So we have an edge banner on this side, a hinge prep machine over in the corner, and then the assortment of different hand tools and small routers and uh, Festool Domino and all those tools are kind of on the far end of the shop here. And then on the other side of the shop, uh, behind those two doors is where our, all our cabinet and furniture finishing is, where we've got our spray room and all that. So you guys know that I've just brought two table saws into my little wood shop, each of which was different than anything I had imagined before, but not as different as this thing is. So tell me about, <laughs> about this thing. I, I just, I can't even really wrap my head around. Okay, right. now that's a sliding table if ever there was one, but everything is computer controlled? Like show us how that even works and what sure. the tolerance is on this. Sure. This is our big control box for the, for the table saw. Right. So it's got all the bells and whistles in it. So I'll just explain it really quick. 
So, uh, and I'll show you how it works. This is the 45 adjustment to whatever degree we want on the table saw. This little feature here is what drives the saw blade up and down. Well, so you can set the depth of cut right there. Right, and I can actually, um, so it runs a 16 inch blade, so we can do a, a five inch cut in height. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we can cut a big piece of wood. Yeah. And then it's got the main saw, the main saw blade here, um, and then it's actually got a scoring blade for plywood. Oh. So when you're cutting through, it doesn't tear out the, the bottom edge oh, of that yeah, plywood. Oh yeah, so you don't spall off the bottom veneer. But the main, the slickest feature is the ball and screw action of the adjustable fence. Show us that. So all we do here, and we do in uh, either millimeters or inches, we just put in our number and it's gonna adjust it up to a thousandth of an inch. So let's go, we're gonna go 15 inches. We're gonna hold this button down and that's gonna that. auto slide. Bam, 15 inches. Like on the money. On the money every time. Remember Scott, we're wow. a production shop. Yes, you are. Speed and quality. Speed, Speed and quality. Speed and quality. Yeah. Hard to get these things in the same package. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. So this is an edge bander. This is something that came up when you dove into cabinets hard, I assume. An immediate ne necessity. Okay, so what is an edge bander and why and how and what is this? Man, I tell you what, Scott, it's just the simplest, the simplest concept, but it's a complicated piece of equipment. Yeah, I could see that. All it does, it puts, it puts this edge banding, and this come, this is just basically a veneer, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sometimes it comes finished and it comes in a couple different sizes. All this does is put this veneer on the edge of a piece of plywood. Okay, okay. It is a cabinet built specific equipment. But it, it glues it on, it adheres it, and boom. Trims it, cuts it on all four sides. Really? Yeah, it does all that and then buffs, <coughs> buffs it off. But yeah, this is a dedicated cabinet tool. So like I said, we started off as a furniture shop, a dedicated furniture shop, mm -hmm. which we brought our quality in furniture into our cabinet I work. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into our cabinet work. But once we started hitting that cabinet work, we need an edge bander, so yeah. we bought this piece of equipment. Wow, what a beauty. I don't know if I've mentioned this already, but one of the things that I really am enjoying about this is you got high tech and you got high tech and low tech. Right. So so these are not just eyewash, right? This is not just to make people like me feel better. No. You use these things. Talk to us about the interface between tools that have been around for thousands of years and the tools that have been around for a year. Right. Yeah, so I guess and I didn't coin this term, hybrid word working comes to mind. Okay. Um, so how do you blend the new technology with still the old school craftsmanship? Uh -huh. And we, I think we do that pretty well here. Um, and it all just comes down to the necessity of whatever the project we're working on. I mean, Scott, you know, the most classic there it is. woodworker tool, the hand plane. Yeah, that's right? right. Yeah. And we use these every single day, depending on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So we're finding that balance of, what works efficiently, what works quickly, and we choose the tool accordingly. Yeah. That doesn't always mean a brand new tool. Interesting. So tell me about this workstation, this bench, what, what goes on and, and give me some of the details yeah. that, what goes on here? Yeah, so I was all geared up, you know, as a woodworker to, to build that bench, right? right? That's, a, that's a, key, a key piece in a shop. But I had this old feller who, uh, man, he was such a good craftsman, but he was moving out of the area and he offered me his bench. Oh. Um, man, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't pass it up. Um, so he built in some really, really cool features. I mean, this, this top here is about, I don't know, probably about four and a half inches. And man, this thing is heavy. These, uh, these England vices that are on it, um, Scott, man, they, they run for about $300 each and it came with the tool. Oh, but man, yeah. the craftsmanship on these old guys are, are just great. And what he did here, I really, really like it. This is this peg system. You've seen this. You've seen this in fabrication before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fab you know, shops so have you, ideas. So like you can this. clamp stuff up. Well, they kind of brought that into woodworking. Same idea. So what what he did, which is great here, is you put these little dowels in here, and they got you, flat shoulders. And they got flat shoulders. You put your piece in here like this. Oh and yeah. And then you can put whatever size piece you want. Wow. It's actually got a quick action as well for sizing pieces, and then you can tighten her down and and work on whatever you want. Holy smokes, you can squeeze mortise and tenon on a, on a door frame together. You can yep. pinch that. Wow. Yeah. So that quick slide, it's yeah. like a, it's like a free, wheel, free, free wheel on a winch on a cat. You can't right. set chokers without free wheel. Right. And you gotta have that on your winch, on, exactly. your, on your vice. That's awesome. Exactly. So I started in this guy and then we moved, we, we needed some big workbenches. So that same peg system idea, minus the clamps, we kind of brought over here. Same, same idea, work against a piece, got some specialty clamping stuff for this guy as well. 
and put your piece on here and then have something to stop against. Yeah. I'm and I've got two of these. These are uh, about four by eight. Uh -huh. And uh, this is actually called a torsion box. Okay. Torsion yep. box. Yep. So it's, yep. it's got some strength. Yeah. So that's just to keep it flat. And yep. then every year we take it off. It's got a, a big MDF top. We'll put a layer of shellac on it so glue doesn't stick to it. Oh. But every year we take it off, throw it on the CNC, flatten her back down. True it up. New, new thing of shellac and it's good to go for another year. This is the spray booth and um, I, I would say that the most special part about having like this entire area is it prevents like all the dust from the wood shop to come in and I can really focus on like a really nice clean finish. Um, I'm able to just pump out like a lot of different things that go towards cabinetry and furniture. So it's always really cool to see the finished product at the end. Without the ventilation in this room, I would die. <laughs> like all the chemicals would just like, it would just be so harsh and almost, I would say like not worth like doing this job. Like being able to, to have what I have here with the ventilation, it, like keeps my body like safe. So this is Trenton. You're the IT digital guru around here, yeah, right? Yeah, most of the design work, anything that needs to be CNC'd, digitally designed for the sake of renders, for showing customers uh, projects before we even build them. Well, that helps, doesn't it? It helps it sales. It does, oh, yes it does. Man. This was the uh, Chop Saber Pro 510 CNC machine. Okay. It's a router specifically, though the head okay. can be swapped out for other things. All right, and so that's the router bit. That's the cutting implement right here, right? Yes. And it's not going to bite me if I touch it, right? It will not bite you if you touch it, correct. Okay. Plenty sharp. So put this thing through its paces a little bit. Show us a little bit of magic here. Right. So we've got ourselves set up with a little block of wood. Uh, we need to replicate, actually right over here, uh, another one of these guys here. This was also done on the CNC machine. Um, but we used with a bit that wasn't tall enough to get all the way through the rest of the material. So actually in the cutting operation, this started getting a little bit burnt near the edge of the uh, top because of how much friction is being caused by non-cutting portions of the bit at the top of the material. But I've got this designed and programmed to be cut out of that block right there for you if you want to see how this whole thing operates. Um, with this particular machine, it comes with built-in uh, pneumatic pin alignment features, makes it super nice for repeatability. We're machining a lot of the same parts like plywood, for instance. There's a uh, press of the button on the computer here. We'll fire up some uh, pins out of the table. Whoa. You can see those actuate and it gives us a consistent reference point along the X and Y axis so that we could put repeatable pieces like plywood on here, or in this case, a block of wood lines perfectly up there. I've uh, pre-drilled some holes. We do oh. have a vacuum bed built into this machine. Uh, oh, I see. If you fire it off, you could uh, see the entire uh, MDF sheet that's sitting on here is actually, you know what, move it out of the way. You can see underneath here, this uh, phenolic table yeah. has been grooved out with uh, passageways for air to flow through. And in the center of each one of these different units, you can see them broken up along the whole thing. Each one corresponds here. So unit one, for instance, has the vacuum on. If I turn that on, there is a hose underneath here that's pulling a, that is an eight horsepower uh, vacuum yeah. pump. Yeah. Wow. An eight horsepower vacuum pump located on the back side of the machine draws air straight down. The MDF, being a relatively um, porous material, allows air to be pulled through it. So if I press start here, the uh, software is going to read through the file, make sure there's not going to be any interruptions with, uh, it goes too far off the table this way, or I can't cut that deep with this particular bit. Mm -hmm. It's very smart. It knows it's exactly just, where everything's just at. checking the programmers. And it will uh, make sure that I've got all my ducks in a row. If everything's good, the spindle will fire off and it will start cutting. That's turning standard router speed, roughly. 18,000 18, RPM. Mm -hmm. I've got it doing a ramping pass, so it will slowly lower itself in the material. It's better for the bit, good mm -hmm. longevity for the machine as well, and it's better for the material. Sure. Wood being an organic substrate will move around a lot mm -hmm. on you as you're machining it, so it's yeah. good to kind of do slow passes. Right now, it's only gonna do about a half an inch step down at a time, so it doesn't maximize the- uh, Still a fair cut. cut. It's That's a, decent, a fair cut. Decent chunk, yeah. And for how tall this particular bit is, we're gonna be able to get all the way through this material, uh, which is three inches thick. Wow.
talk to me about your relationship with clients because that's yeah. the two that's the two-edged sword you, you really are in a creative service yeah. uh, business here you're providing service yeah. what is there that is full I, I mean we know what's challenging about dealing with other people. What is there that's fulfilling about dealing with clients and making these beautiful things like right. that black walnut table that you're resting your elbow on there? Yeah. That's a beautiful thing, both because of nature and because of craftsmanship. Yes. Talk to us about introducing a product like this to a client. We're sitting in my showroom right now, mm -hmm. and it's just, all this is, um, I'm on, the showroom isn't designed around, honestly, selling a lot of pieces physically out of it, mm -hmm. but it's to open people's creative mind to the opportunity and possibility that they can see in their own home, mm -hmm. right? So I'm yeah. just introducing ideas, mm -hmm. but things that they can physically touch, products that they can physically see. And I mean, our website does as good as we can online as well to kind of show that as well to communicate to clients. But communicating with clients guys, is a difficult thing. Big deal, isn't it? Yes, it is. Especially when you're, when you're getting a livelihood off of it, yeah. right? Yeah. And not just, now not just getting a livelihood, but also supporting a team in their livelihood. Yeah, yeah okay. That's right? a whole next <laughs> level, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, but but I think that just the key is honestly, and, and you know, maybe this is overset or whatever. If you, if you keep on pushing out high quality craftsmanship, right? And you can connect that to your client, I think you're gonna be successful. All right, so backing up to the way we started this, that a career as a paramedic is grueling and has huge emotional cost. And in 2015 and the brutality of, of everything that sort of snowballed into that year, and you were looking for some sort of actualization outside of that and a creative outlet. Yeah. Which has turned into its own tiger by the tail. I can tell, <laughs> man, you've yes. got a tiger by the tail. Yes. So what is there in the woodwork now for you that brings fulfillment? I mean, fulfillment in your grandfather's shop right. was easier. What part of what you're doing now is fulfilling for you? So as that evolved, don't get me wrong, I'm still the guy that likes to put in his headphones and just do the hard craftsmanship and just mm -hmm. just spend that time, you know, be able to disconnect. I'm still that guy. What I didn't realize about building a business is how much I've enjoyed building and growing a team and oh. seeing them be successful. You met Laura, you met Trenton. It's like I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing people and still do, but that are so creative and different than I am. And seeing and recognizing their value that they bring and how excited that they are and that we can grow this thing together. Hallman Woodwork's success is not me. Hallman Woodwork's success is my team. What a great perspective because I've learned that we think we build only with our hands, but we're actually building with our relationships and our network. So now you've got a chance to meet somebody that I recently got a chance to meet. And more importantly, you got to hear a story that I recently got to hear. It fits so, so beautifully with what it is that we bring to this channel, and that is the doggone it, sometimes it's time for a change. And doggone it, sometimes it's time to stay where you're at and keep doing what you're doing. And Matt has blended those things masterfully. One of the things that, frankly, was a little surprising and pleasing was how often and how genuinely Matt emphasized how much he enjoyed working with his team and the value he put on the people that he surrounded himself with to move their collective vision of Hallman Woodworks forward. Maybe that's the real takeaway here, is that individualism is important and rugged individualism is not just a myth, but there is no compensating and there is no substitution for the value of a group of like-minded folks all heading in the same direction. And maybe that's the takeaway on the story of Hallman Woodworks. And maybe that's something that you can employ as you're thinking about how in the world you are going to actually switch from what it is you're doing now to what it is you want to be doing five or eight or ten years into your future. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.